Harvard always has been a place where, you know, anti-Semitism could have thrived and thrived. Jewish people were not allowed, as Black people were not allowed in these institutions. The ivory towers never wanted Black people and people of color. We were not even allowed to have access to education, which is why historically Black colleges and universities were created. There's like this new witch hunt, this new age of McCarthyism taking place, not only in, in, in uh, academic spaces, but also media spaces. Coming up on The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. The resignation of Claudine Gay, a widely esteemed scholar and the first black president of Harvard in the university's 387 years, reveals much, both about how America is failing at its highest ideals and about how anti-black backlash campaigns work in this country. In this case, a politically motivated grilling in Congress was followed by an organized campaign to attack Gay's credibility and intellect that fed an ongoing assault on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts, or DEI, in education. And all of that was coupled with the especially toxic accusation in these times that diversity was increasing anti-Semitism. Much of all of this was familiar, of course. We've seen years of trumped-up campaigns against truthful education and critical race theory. In just last year, the right scored a huge victory, one they'd been pursuing for decades when the Supreme Court struck down affirmative action. In some ways, what was different this time was the support that Gay had and the pushback that was seen, especially from people of color in the media and in the academy. Today, we're going to look at some of that pushback and consider why the failure to understand racism and sexism and how they intersect in our culture is so important, not only for black women and all women of color, but for anyone's dream of a multiracial democracy in America. Joining our monthly Meet the BIPOC Press discussion this time around are Saide Dinzi Flores, a professor and chair of Latino and Caribbean studies at Rutgers University, and Jamie Swift, the founder and executive director of Black Women Radicals. I'm also happy to welcome, as co-host this time, Amir Kafaji. He's a labor reporter for Documented, which is a member of the URL Media Network, URL being a network of independent media owned and operated by people of color. Amir, I'm so glad to have you with me for this important conversation. Welcome. Thanks for having me. I've been thinking about this for a long time, and I've been excited to be here. With the recent controversy around Dr. Gay, and the repression of anti-Zionist speech on college campuses and in the media, this entire trend you know, worries me a lot. People of color are not strongly represented in the media and on college campuses. It seems that in these white dominated institutions, they pretend to value our vo voices. It seems to me that if we express our unique perspectives on different issues, we can be punished or we can be demonized. Turning to you, Saide, you wrote a recent piece about Dr. Gay in Grio, and I was wondering if you could speak more about what the controversy means to people of color in academia and in the media. When I learned of Dr. Gay's resignation, I thought it was important um, to voice what many, I think, Black women, uh, academics in particular, were feeling, and that is constant scrutiny, um, questioning of our motives and capacity and also whether we are competent to be teachers. Um, and for those of us who dare explore academic leadership, whether um, we can hold those positions. So it was a reminder of how difficult and treacherous the road um, in academia is for those of us who don't represent uh, the majority. Does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. What's the context? Targeted as an individual, targeted as, at an individual. It's Do targeted at Jewish it? students, Jewish individuals. Do you understand your testimony is dehumanizing them? Do you understand that dehumanization is part of antisemitism? I will ask you one more time. 
does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment? Yes or no? Anti-Semitic rhetoric. When it and is it anti-Semitic rhetoric? Anti-Semitic rhetoric when it crosses into conduct that amounts to bullying, harassment, intimidation, that is actionable conduct and we do take action. So the answer is yes, that calling for the genocide of Jews violates Harvard code of conduct, correct? Again, it depends on the context. It does not depend on the context. The answer is yes, and this is why you should resign. These are unacceptable answers across the board. Jamie, coming to you, I'd love to hear your reaction as you watch this play out. And especially, I don't know about you, but I began to feel shades of McCarthyism, but maybe of a new sort playing out in front of us. Yes, what we experienced or saw with Dr. Gay is definitely a form of McCarthyism in a different era. And we've been seeing these right-wing attacks happen without throughout the last past few years, particularly against uh, black feminist theory, such as intersectionality, right, and critical race theory. We've seen how Kimberly Crenshaw has been attacked for her theoretical frameworks. We've also seen pushbacks against anything dealing with queer and trans studies or gender studies, right? And so this is a continuum of what we've seen throughout the past few years, but also a larger history where these institutions, the ivory towers never wanted black people and people of color. Right. We as black people, we were not even allowed to have access to education, which is why historically black colleges and universities were created. Right. And we even see attacks against HBCUs as well. HBCU being historically black colleges and universities. The other chilling aspect, though, and, and where I see the McCarthyism was Dr. Gay had pretty early last fall um, disavowed anti-Semitism, anti spoken up against rising anti-Semitism on campus. But then we saw this kind of effort, particularly I'm thinking of the congressional hearings, but also in what happened to, to require her to say it over and over again or, or in more and different ways. And I'd love to hear from you, Jamie, uh, about that aspect. H how do you see that adding to what you've described as a fairly familiar scenario? Um, I see it in multiple ways, and I believe that multiple truths can exist, right? I believe that there was a witch hunt against Dr. Gay because she's a Black woman. I do think that they people were forcing her over and over again to prove her uh, leadership, um, her presidency as a Black woman. And three, we also see where, and this is where um, the multiple truths can exist, where even though Dr. Gay experience this misogynistic or misogynistic witch hunt, she also, according to students and faculty and staff, failed to protect Palestinian Black um, and other allied students, faculty and staff who support the pro-Palestinian cause, right? And so this is the precarity of Black leadership in academia, but in other places, right, where she has some sort of way had to choose between disavowing anti-Semitism, which is very real, we're not going to deny that, but also to disavow other marginalized communities, such as Palestinian Black and other allied students with the pro-Palestinian cause, right? So where does she fit into this place, right? And this shows that DEI is not working. DEI is not a liberatory politic, because if DEI was a liberatory politic, Dr. Claudine Gay would be able to speak truth to power to both anti-Semitic, right, and also anti-Islamophobic and anti-Palestinian attitudes, forces, beliefs, right, at Harvard or anywhere else she lays her, her feet or steps. Now, I went to Queens College um, in CUNY in New York City, and it was a very diverse school. Previously to, previous to that, I went to LaGuardia Community College, and that was also very diverse. Um, it had a high representation of Black and Latino students. I felt very comfortable in that institution. So, Saide, you had previously mentioned that you had attended Harvard for your undergrad. And I was wondering, did you feel like you faced more scrutiny or you were held to an um, unrealistic higher standard than the white student body? I went to college in the 90s. Uh, you, where in affirmative action was experiencing uh, challenges then. And uh, questioning about whether, you know, we got in for those reasons or whether, you know, we're 
intelligent enough to be there? What are the markers? How do we get there? Those have always been true. I mean, we see it still in debates around standardized testing. We see it in debates around um, uh, what kinds of uh, racial information, race information is going to be um, included in applications, how class figures in all of this. So yes, I, I think that's a standard experience for um, any professional um, student uh, in predominantly white institutions. And I would argue even even if and when they're diverse, I don't think that you know places uh, like LaGuardia, you know, or um, Queens College are exempt from this. It makes me think of something that Jamie had said previously that universities have never truly loved black academics structurally, and that historically, black people were never really allowed into those spaces. Well, to follow up on that, Jamie, um, we've introduced you and talked about how you were co-founder of Black Women Radicals. You also teach at an institution. Um, what's this experience been like for you? And do you think it is possible to actually be a Black woman radical in an institution? And if so, and if so, why? I think my experience has been very interesting. So I come out of the tradition of Howard University. I got my PhD in political science um, at Howard University, a historically Black university. Um, and so for me, having the experience, like Amir talking about LaGuardia and Queens College, obviously, it's diverse. Just because there are these white institutions, right, that have historically subordinated Black people does not mean that these things don't happen at Black institutions, right? Because Black people are not monolithic, we're heterogeneous, right? And we have different experiences. But coming out of teaching or being at an HBCU to a PWI. PWI being predominantly white institutions. It's very interesting given that I'm one of the very few Black women in my department, Black people in my department, right? So there's this expectation of me to come in and undo um, the legacies of not teaching about Black people. I study power, so I study Black politics, right? So it's me coming and having to teach these students who do not know anything about Ralph Bunch or Drew Lamar Prestage or all these prolific Black academics. I think about uh, many other Black women in academia who were also activists, right? Like Tony Kane Bambera, um, uh, June Jordan, Audre Lorde. So I do think that I can be a Black woman radical in academia because of this lineage of Black women in academia. But I also recognize that I cannot put all my life and politics into this place that does not want me to be there. You know, I think what is tough uh, is when you are doing scholarship in the context of uh, empire and colony and teaching about it to the point that uh, Jamie was making about um, how difficult it is to be a scholar and navigate institutions and so protecting your um, health but also your livelihood and your um, capacity to, you know, exist, um, and we are hyper visible, and we are all often drawn in to talk about, you know, the things that uh, stab at the heart, um, that address our own particular survival. Um, so I, I think that's what's hard um, in this case in dealing with um, a very uh, uh, sort of um, a minefield of an issue. And I saw it in the way in which um, Claudine Gay navigated that, and I see it every day. And I experience it every day um, in navigating um, uh, these topics that uh, become the target of uh, ideologues and political fervor. At the very top, um, Zayde, I mentioned that I thought there was something different in this particular scenario because we've seen a growth in independent media owned and operated by people of color. You wrote your piece for the GRIO. Um, there are many more part of the URL network and beyond. Am I right in thinking that maybe at least in that respect we're seeing some change or is this a, a rosy tinted glass being applied to what's going on Zayde? I'll tell you what I think was missing. I think there was quite a bit missing. There was no reporting on uh, Black academics. 
in general, right, a greater breadth. There was no, there was little reporting on um, what academia is like. So even when the conversation turned to plagiarism, um, there was little kind of discussion of the processes for academic review and how that happens and what it's like for Black academics and academics of color to face those processes. And there was also, I think, a lot missing on uh, Black alums of these elite institutions. And we saw, uh, and I was, you know, part of, you know, Black alums that were getting together and talking and um, and sort of, you know, noting uh, what was happening institutionally. And, and I think that got very little attention. And so the, uh, you know, the most of the attention um, went to these wealthy um, uh, white uh, men that are Harvard alums and uh, it reproduced the very same uh, inequities that exist um, uh, with respect to uh, institution. So as an Arab American who works in the media, I find the conversation around Palestinian liberation and the current war on Gaza very frustrating. It doesn't seem that the mainstream media is getting it right. And it seems the same thing is happening around this conversation about Dr. Gay and um, the university's response to what's going on now in with the Palestinian, uh, the attack on Gaza and with the Palestinian liberation movement. And I was wondering if you, Jamie, could talk a little bit about what do you think the media is getting right about the controversy and what is it getting wrong and what do you wish could be added to that conversation? What media, particularly black and people of color operated media is getting correct is that it was a witch hunt. This is attack against Dr. Claudine Gay because she's black and she's a woman, she's a black woman, right? Um, and those intersections are so critical. But what is also missing to me, and this is where the multiple truths uh, a perspective comes in, that she did not want to protect Palestinian black and other marginalized students who are pro-Palestinian, right? Because what we're seeing is, is that across the universities and many other sectors, if you say ceasefire now, we want to end the genocide from the river to the sea. These are being equated to being anti-Semitic statements, and they're not. As president and also other faculty, administration, and staff, we're supposed to be right in the interest of all of our students and not just a few or not just some. The other piece of this picture, it seems to me, that reporting missed was the nature of the support on the campus for Claudine Gay and also the concern that students who identify as Jewish actually have about anti-Semitism coming from the right, um, coming from conservatives who have long been, you know, bound up their racism with anti-Semitism. And we've seen examples of that recently. I don't know about you, but I would have liked to see more reporting on that. And I'm wondering, Zaide, if that's something that I just missed in the coverage. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that. I think that there, um, uh, you know, this became a uh, one person um, uh, focused uh, topic rather than one that really emphasized the kinds of fault lines that were being put at play. So the people that are that were being positioned against the other, and I think we've seen this, I think this is a colonial logic at play where let's make sure that um, we cannot find the, the ways in which these two groups or different groups um, come together and coalesce. Um, and we've seen it before. We saw it with affirmative action, with the knockdown of affirmative action, the way in which Asian communities were put against Latinx and Black uh, communities in um, having a position in education and higher ed. Um, and we see it here too, I think, with uh, Jewish communities. I mean, to be clear, racism is an issue, classism, sexism, right? Um, 
uh, as are anti-Semitism, as are um, uh, anti-Palestinian um, rhetoric, right? All of these are true and coexist. And so I think that the win of white supremacy is to suggest that, that they don't um, live together. And it was a strategic use um, of that uh, of that rhetoric um, to to put us against each other. And I think that uh, we're all concerned for all of those things and how do we um, sort of subvert and uh, this trend to, uh, to suggest that we are indeed against each other when in fact, we are all looking for a uh, representation. I mean, Harvard, not now, always has been a place uh, where, you know, anti-Semitism could have thrived and thrived. Jewish people were not allowed, as Black people were not allowed in these institutions. It feels to me that there's like this new witch hunt, this new age of McCarthyism taking place, not only in, in, in uh, academic spaces, but also media spaces. We're seeing reporters losing their jobs or, or being forced to resign because if they had a pro-Palestinian stance, uh, we're seeing we're seeing on the, uh, in academia, we're seeing students for justice for Palestinian groups on campuses being repressed and new laws on campuses or, or regulations on campuses that say that you have to support, support Israel, and almost like in the McCarthy era where you had to denounce communism in order to get a job. So we're seeing these things grow now and, and take hold in these spaces. And I was wondering, either one of you can talk about how we can fight this new kind of witch hunt, this new age of McCarthyism taking place in the media and in academia. So this witch hunt we're seeing is a current manifestation of what has happened in the past. And for me, um, my responsibility is to speak truth to power. June Jordan, very well-known Black feminist poet said, Palestine is a litmus test. It's our litmus test. I liken this to um, a young non-binary Black radical by the name of Rhino Workman, who was at NYU Law and spoke out against right what was happening in Palestine. And they lost a, a, a well-paying job. And they uh, were no longer serving as president of the club that they were at NYU. And so, of course, we're going to be the first ones attacked in our livelihoods and, and our you know economic uh, 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 safety nets attacked, and I get that. But also, I think about if I'm supposed to be a Black feminist, a Black woman radical, the same thing happened to June Jordan. She was ousted for writing poetry in support of Palestine. And so for me, um, I think we really need to continue to push um, and to, like I said, speak out about what's going on because... These institutions have never really wanted us anyway. You don't accept my humanity. You don't accept who I uh, who I uh, am as a person. You just want me as a black face in this place, and that's not who I am, and that's not me. June Jordan taught at many universities, but if you look at the archives of the New York Times, she goes from being a pretty regular commentator to the op-ed page to disappearing um, from that page after the the comments that you mentioned around the Israeli bombardment of the Palestinian refugee camps in Lebanon in eighty two. Namir? Sayadeh, you've written previously about Puerto Rico and the gated communities that exist there. And, and I was wondering if you can speak about some of the parallels between, I guess, what, you know, the Palestinian liberation movement and, and the Puerto Rican experience. I've written about um, gated communities in uh, Puerto Rico and the way that the built environment is utilized to sort of like control and reproduce um, racial and class uh, distinction in uh, in Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico being, uh, uh, you know, one of the oldest colonies um, in the world and in the ways in which um, uh, colonial policies um, are uh, established. It's obviously there are parallels there um, with Palestine. I'm left with this sort of my usual question is, is the blatant pushback because the forces of progress are, um, are gaining some ground? Well, I, I like to think that maybe these, these, uh, these 
strong attacks that we are facing is because maybe the movement is getting stronger and and there's a vulnerability that the that the right feels and that's why they're attacking even stronger and are and they're being even more dangerous than they ever have been well thank you all it's been a great conversation and wonderful to have you with me amir for it thank you for having me i really appreciate it it was a pleasure happy to be here to talk about this important topic um and thanks for having me it's been a really generative conversation thank you You've been watching The Laura Flanders Show. Meet the BIPOC Press is a special monthly feature of the program. You can get a lot more information and all our archives at our website. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org.